Hello there, guys. My name is Dave Coker. Today we're going to be talking about chat GPT from the student perspective. So first of all, I'll introduce myself. I'll give you guys an idea about my background and you'll understand why I'm here. We'll talk briefly about chat GPT. We'll talk about some of the media's handling of the announcement of this product. We'll talk about appropriate use of this tool in education. And the goal here is to help you understand what you can and cannot do with chat GPT for assessments or for your education overall. And I'll show you some tools that you can actually use that are based upon the same technology as chat GPT. So in terms of my, myself, as I mentioned, my name is Dave Coker. I'm a lecturer here at the University in Finance. I'm program manager for the MSC FinTech, which we're launching in June. I describe myself as a fintech pioneer and a veteran of what we call global Wall Street. Um, you know, decades ago, say 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Wall Street was just Wall Street and the culture in London, in the financial districts in London, Frankfurt, Paris, Amsterdam, all places I've worked, was very, very different. But now Wall Street culture has been adopted globally. So we have this uh, creation called Global Wall Street. And I've also been very, very fortunate that I've worked abroad in Africa, in the Middle East, and spent a lot of time in Sub-Saharan Africa, and even up to North Africa. I've been in a lot of time in Cairo as well, and we're talking years, and across the Middle East, a couple different places. Now, I'm, I do a fair amount for the media on these topics, and I'm just very interested in these topics. I have a lot of opinions. I'm not afraid to share them. <laughs> Uh, I've done a fair amount of television work as well, mostly on Al Jazeera, BBC, a few other stations. Presently, as since I've been since I left banking, I should say, I've been selling market commentary to investment banks, and I found a source. Ooh, about about six months ago, maybe nine months ago, I found a source that I can post excerpts from my long form market commentary. We're talking, you know, articles that are about five thousand words. They come out once a month, once every three weeks or so. I can take one of those articles and chop it up into many smaller articles. And what I do is I post them on a website called Medium. And you can find them if you go to Google News and type Dave Coker in. And you'll, you'll find those articles and things like that. Published in Wyatt Wiley's The AI Book. It's in the university's library. You can take a look at it. I wrote a chapter on applying artificial intelligence for risk management to hopefully avoid uh, problems like the global financial crisis, which was what we call a systemic event. And we were going to have two more volumes of that book, but then this thing called pandemic happened, right? And uh, th th those two got postponed. They're, they're coming out now later, and you'll be able to find, um, find me in, in AI applications, which is coming out in Q4, I believe. I'd have to talk to the, to the editor again. I, as I mentioned, I don't don't really uh, hold back on my opinions about things. I'm very curious. So if you go to FinTech Flash News, you'll see a blog I've been running for about 15 years, actually, called FinTech Flash News. <laughs> and what we do is we talk about FinTech. Every day there's an update. No story, I, there's a reading time suggested for each story. No story takes more than 10 minutes. And, and to be honest with you, the greater majority are one to two minutes. I have another blog that I've run for about, oh, about two years now. It was very slowly, I was building it up relatively slowly because I've been interested in applying artificial intelligence to education for some time. And then when ChatGPT launched, I quickly grabbed that new, that domain name, I, uh, AINews.education. And actually, uh, I, to be honest with you, I've got about 16 others. I, I grabbed everything in AI news. <laughs> I've got AI news .finance .trading .training. Uh, I can't recall exactly which ones I got. I got, well, I got AI finance .lol as well. So AI news, I should say, .lol. So take, check that out. You can get more information about AI and its application to education there as well. We'll go through this relatively quickly because it's not super germane, unless you're really into finance. But I've done, done a fair amount in banking started in 1987 with Dow Jones in Manhattan, moved to Deutsche Bank, took on the role as uh, Vice President of Global Risk Management, went to ABN AMRO, and I actually worked there twice. I went When I left Deutsche, I went to ABN, didn't like it so much. Uh, Moody's had, had hunted me. So I went to Moody's, was there a few years, about six years, and then 
uh, move back to ABN Amro when they offer me the role as being uh, to run risk management globally. I've got all the good education you would expect somebody at this an institution of this caliber to have, and I've got a strong background in teaching. So this is nothing that I, when I left bank, I said, oh, I know, I'll go teach. I've seen people like that and they, they just don't, they don't perform well. They don't enjoy it. And I really enjoy this. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't be doing this. I haven't had to work since 2002. So if I didn't enjoy this, I would be off doing something else. I'm not sure what I would do, <laughs> but um, I just enjoy teaching a great deal and helping students like yourself achieve your goals. Now, when we talk about AI, the media does a disservice because they send these odd stories out there that are just totally nuts. And I'll help you understand just how crazy they are by the end of this presentation. So could it do your job better than you? I don't know. I mean, you know possibly. We'd have to see. Our new AI overlords, massive disruption. My God. This one has an element of truth. Who needs journalists when you can get ChatGPT to do all the work? There's no element of truth there because BuzzFeed, if you ever looked at that site, when ChatGPT came out about two weeks later, they fired 30 journalists and they're going to be using ChatGPT and people that are called prompt engineers, and I'll, I'll explain that later, to do the work for them. Abstracts, yep, that was fooled by uh, fooled scientists written by ChatGPT. Redefining human expertise, uh, it, you know, the AI is not smart. It's just not, and I'll, I'll convince you of that by the end of this presentation. Is it going to destabilize white-collar work? No, 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 no. It's going to change certain aspects of it. And finally, this is a bizarre one. I, I just had to include it because it was just so strange, right? Uh, America has really bad inequality across many axes, many dimensions. Wealth inequality is one of them. We do fine broadening the wealth inequality or making it more severe without having without needing AI. So it's this is just a bizarre headline. So the, the media is totally nuts about ChatGPT and they've got a lot of oddball ideas. This all rippled into stocks and this is off some of the market research I sell. Anytime you see a chart and I, I love charting and putting together presentations, you see Coker.me, that's me, I'm Coker. <laughs> And you can see here, if you look at uh, these are, four, are three stocks, and I put the NASDAQ in as a benchmark, uh, C3.ai up 134% year to date as of December's, uh, February, I think I did that on the, the 8th is when I ran that. Baidu 33%, Splunk up some 22%. And this hysteria spread into the cryptocurrency market. And here you can see selected cryptocurrencies. They're really booming. And I, I use the red line in my analysis and in my market research, I was talking about this further. You can see that 89% of the money that went into the artificial liquid intelligence has been put in over the past 24 hours when I did this analysis. And singularity.net is massively uh, overvalued as well. Some 59% of its market cap slid in there. So people are really, really crazy about AI right now. It's, it's really got a lot of attention. And it's interesting because I'm going to show you how this stuff works. And people talk about how smart it is. Well, it's not. The intelligence that we perceive is nothing more than an illusion. And there is a classic theory of intelligence. And I've got the academic papers, if you guys are curious, drop me a mail. And it says that we can take simple actions and take these really, really simple actions, put them together, and form a more complex action. Now, if you've ever seen, and this applies to robotics as well, if you've ever seen what's called a Roomba, one of these uh, self-controlled, self -control, these robotic, I should say, vacuum cleaners that go around the room, it, they don't know how to do much. All they can do is drive until they hit something, some obstruction, and then they go 90 degrees. <laughs> That's all they do. It's actually pretty interesting watching them. I, I don't have one. I want to get one because I want my cat to ride it. That would, that would be pretty cool, I think. But in any case, all they do is they, 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 they have simple actions, but when they put them together many, many times, it appears complex, and people believe the Roomba is smart. It's not really smart. It just appears intelligent because it's doing simple things many, many times. And that, guys, is exactly what ChatGPT is up to. And that's why it appears intelligent. It does very simple stuff many, many times. And you look at it, the output, you go, my God, that thing is smart. Well, not really. Now, ChatGPT is what we call a large language model, or LLM. And the key takeaway from this is that an LLM allows us to understand relationships between words. So given a word, 
we can actually figure out what word is most likely to follow it using an LLM. Now, they define relationships as something called a reasonable continuation. And all that means is that there's certain words that you, when you use them, you would never expect to find another word after it. Let me give you an example of this. Oh, and, and then the reverse is true. There are some words when you find, when you see them, there are some words that you expect to follow immediately. Let's take a look. So if we're given the string, the best thing about living in London is the... Now, OpenAI, the people that created ChatGPT, called this the prompt. So given this prompt, all ChatGPT does, and remember, it, it, it's educated on the internet. All it does is it's looked through the internet. It's looked at tens of millions, hundreds of millions of resources. We'll talk about how many later. But it's looked at all these resources, and it knows that most of the time, or I should say 78% of the time, when it sees the string, the, the prompt, the best thing about living in London is the food follows it. Weather follows it 42% of the time. People follows it 38% of the time. Rubbish <laughs> follows it 4% of the time. Crime, 3%, and noise, 1%. Now, chat GPT is dumb. So it doesn't know. And if people say stuff like the rubbish is really good, I, I love the rubbish in London, really what they're doing is they might be being sarcastic. The same thing with crime and noise. All chat GPT does is it knows statistically these relationships. And then it asks itself a question. It says, what word should follow the prompt? The word the imprompt. Let's take a look at this. We're going to do it and understand exactly how it works. Because when it follows the word, the prompt, when it follows a word onto the prompt, it does it in a semi-random manner. OpenAI calls this temperature. It's called a parameter. And it controls the selection of these words that were low probability. Remember our prompt. The best thing about living in London is the food, the weather, the people, the crime. And if you use OpenAI, or ChatGPT, I should say, if you enter a prompt, you ask it the same question twice, you'll get two different answers. It's really wild. So that is the temperature, and that's what it does. The, depending upon the value of temperature, you're more likely to get a strict response that reflects very well in the data, or you're going to get a random response. Now, temperature is what's called a parameter. And, and again, the best thing about living in London is called the prompt. So we can use temperature. We can override temperature. Using the temperature is 0 0.2. The best thing about living in London is, and we will create an illusion of intelligence. And here we go. I entered this directly. Using the temperature is 0 0.2, the best thing about living in London is, and here we go. You can see it. It warns us in the first paragraph. And then it gives us the answer in quotes. Pretty interesting stuff, isn't it? Let's take a look. Let's change the parameter again. We're going to use a temperature of 0 0.9. And when we put that in, once again, OpenAI tells us, using a higher temperature, blah, blah, blah. And then you can see the response. And it's different. And once again, if we ran this twice, the same prompt, we would get different answers each time. It doesn't know. It's behaving in a semi-random way. And because of that, we believe it's intelligent. Let's talk a little bit more about ChatGPT and the, and the technology underlying it. And then I'll make you guys experts and you'll understand this very, very well. So ChatGPT, pardon me, GPT-1 started in 2018. 117 million parameters. Remember, temperature is a parameter. I don't know the size. I can't find that. It had very limited language capabilities. I became aware of this model, GPT-2, in 2020 when it came out. 1.5 billion parameters, 40 gigabyte training data set, limited language. I've got it running here at home on my Mac. Really interesting stuff. GPT-3 came out in 2022. 176 billion parameters. And the training data set was much, much larger. And the thing that was striking about GPT-3 compared to GPT-2 is that GPT-3 
can talk very well. GPT-2 was very, very limited in its abilities. And GPT-4 came out in 2023. Look at this, or it will be coming out in 2023. And look at this. Look at the big increase in parameters. 170 trillion compared to 176 billion. These are things that allow the model that will be running on GPT-4, the model to appear intelligent. We don't know much about the training data set. There's speculation it's going to use like Google's BARD does. Google's got their own LLM. There's speculation it's going to use the entire internet. And we know its language is going to be very good because chat GPTs is very good. So there's going to be a huge step up when they release GPT-4. They're sort of uh, backing off. They originally, they were going to release it first or second quarter. Now they're not really talking too much about when it's coming out. So we, we kind of think it might be 2024. Not totally sure at this point. But look at the change when we go to GPT-4. My gosh. GPT-3 is that dot. GPT-4 is that big blob there. It will be, as we say in the slide, a big leap forward in capability. So ChatGPT was built on top of GPT-3.5, but you didn't notice a GPT-3.5 in there. We went right from GPT-2 to 3 and from 3 to 4. GPT-2 was in software, we call it forked. They forked, created a new version called GPT-3.5, and they brought people in. And the people engaged in something called supervised learning. And when they did that, they told the bot, they told the program when it gave us a good answer or a bad answer. And by doing so, it changed the underlying neural networks. It strengthened it when it got an answer correctly. And when it had a bad answer, we told it it didn't answer correctly. And it learned over time what good answers looked like. Once again, guys, ChatGPT is all an illusion of intelligence. But still, it's just technology. And the engineers that built it did some very innovative things. First of all, they made sure that the model, GPT-3.5, would be helpful. So you ask it a question, it gives you a reasonable answer. Compare it to the headlines we've seen recently about Microsoft and Google's AIs. Um, not too helpful. I haven't, uh, I'm not a beta tester. I'm, I am a beta tester for OpenAI. I'm not enrolled in those beta testing programs for Microsoft or Google because, you know, there's just too much going on. I, I can't devote the time. And I don't have to. I like working with ChatGPT so much that I got it at home, on my home computer, right? But it's helpful, unlike models that are put out by competitors. Fact-driven. Now, this is a big one. In AI, we've got a concept called hallucinations. And there is a data set called the Truthful QA data set that allows chat GPT to check its own results and make sure that they're factual. In other words, it's not going to say something dumb. So that's why if you entered that query about the best thing about living in London is you're unlikely to see it ever answer crime because it knows that crime is not a good thing about London. The person who wrote that was being sarcastic when they, when they crafted that answer on the, on the web someplace. It's easy for us to interpret the results, to understand the results. In other words, it's not speaking gibberish. And we've all got this tendency, if we do things quickly, uh, if we don't really think things through, we produce some text that is just garbage. You, you read it and go, what, what, what did I say there? And that's why I always advise students, when you write, set it aside for a few days and then look at it with fresh eyes, and you'll see lots of different problems there. And finally, ChatGPT eliminates biased content or toxic content. And that'll be important. I'll show you something that Microsoft screwed up in 2016 in a moment. There's a data set in the AI community called Real Toxicity. And on that basis, ChatGPT knows when it automatically and randomly generates an answer, it can check it against the data set and ensure that what it's saying is not uh, hurtful, not harmful, not biased, not toxic, as we call it. And this is important, guys, because Microsoft came out with Tay in 2016. <laughs> I got to tell you, I, I remember this distinctly. This is the most entertaining thing I saw in a long time because they launched it and they ended up killing it twice in two days. The second time was permanent. They, they got rid of it and you never heard about Tay again, right? So they launched this chatbot and they were doing unsupervised learning, unlike OpenAI with supervised learning. They let people teach it. And, you know, people on the internet, there's a bunch of jerks. And they taught it to be a racist. And it 
was really interesting. We talk about the dangers of AI in the real world. How do you train your AI? How do you, how do you know the person who's doing the training is appropriate? It's an interesting problem. Uh, it actually turned, they shut it off finally when it turned into a Nazi. It was really, really funny watching this stuff go on. My God, I couldn't believe that they screwed up that bad. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in a long time. They killed it in just 24 hours. So it came out, they killed it, they re reprogrammed it, uh, changed its knowledge base, I should say, relaunched it. It came out the second time. It was no longer a racist. It was a Nazi. <laughs> and They killed it dead. And they didn't do anything until 2023, again. Now, yeah, in America, you know, we sue everybody over everything. And Taylor Swift, some people started up a social media rumor that it was called Tay because it was based upon her views. <laughs> and you can't blame her because she did get a lot of abuse. This was part of the fun of this event. And she tried to sue Microsoft a few months later because they, uh, the, the, you know, because she claimed that she was attached to it. And that, that, suit didn't proceed, but still it was pretty amusing the whole situation. So OpenAI is far, far better than Microsoft's attempts or even Google's attempts. And I'm, I'm including current events, current attempts as well. But we know there's lots of these things around. As we mentioned, it's an LLM, a large language model, and there's a bunch of them. Uh, Apple's actually got some pretty astounding technology uh, behind it, and you've probably run into it with uh, Siri. And I use Siri all the time. Actually, I use Siri, Alexa, OpenAI. I, I, I just like messing around with, with bots and exploring the capabilities of AI. It's actually pretty wild. There's a bunch of specialized tools that are based upon LLMs. So they're not capable of general purpose communication, but they're focused in some areas. And I'm going to give you some tips in a moment. You'll be able to see these things and actually look at them. Now, there's a lot of venture capital moving into this sector very, very rapidly, which is why we saw those share prices explode uh, earlier in the presentation. Now, help, I'll help you understand how we're going to be deploying it in education, specifically to help you guys proceed or succeed, I should say. Some universities are not as forward thinking as us. They have tried to ban it. I think that's ridiculous. We don't prevent students from using calculators or even computers to write up assessments. Totally nuts to try to ban it. So let's take a look at some examples, right? So now you're already using, as I mentioned, technology. So we're not going to handle it any differently than this. The key thing though, I have to warn you, you will not, you cannot, you should not. Just copy and paste from ChatGPT. Don't do that. And here's why. First of all, we know that there's, uh, we have uh, tools that'll help us detect if you do this. So ChatGPT zero launches, go on uh, ainews.education, take a look for, that head, look for that headline, and you'll see there's actually a tool out there, and I've used it, it's getting better. When I wrote this, oh, about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, oh, I wrote this on January uh, 9th, actually. So when I wrote that about six weeks ago, it wasn't super good. It's gotten much, much better, and I, I take material right from open it, from ChatGPT's window, paste it into ChatGPT Zero. And now about 70, maybe 80% of the time, it can flag it and it's a wonderful tool. And turn it in again, this was published on, on AINews.education uh, January 24th. If you take a look at this story, you'll see that we're going to have it in with using Turnitin, which we already use at the university. So what you wanna do is you wanna use this tool for researching. It, well, it's a superb tool to help you research. It's the same thing you would do if you use Google, except it's a little bit more focused. You enter a prompt, you give it some parameters to help refine your output. This is actually called, if you get good at this, guys, it's called prompt engineering. That's what you'll be engaged in. And it's actually, you should look to get good at this because it's a valuable skill. How valuable? Well, oh, this is a duplicate. Sorry about that. My, my apologies. Uh, you can see, I don't know what happened there. I'm sorry. You can see here that one of Google's companies uh, is offering uh, prompt engineer jobs at 250000 to 335000 a year. So it is pretty valuable. If you go on Indeed, you can find prompt engineer jobs. Uh, there, there's a premium, not as rich as this. I was pretty shocked when I saw that, right? Uh, but, but yeah, there, there's definitely a premium. And again, this is a skill that you're going to be ne needing to do for any job. I, I do believe this in less than 10 years, probably as soon as five years, you'll have to have some measure 
of prompt engineering abilities, just like you need to know the office suite to get a job. You have to know how to use a spreadsheet and a word processor to get a job. Let's take a look at this at Usenet. Here, I've asked ChatGPT. I said in 200 words, that's a parameter, telling it how many words. I said, compare the profitability of McDonald's Corporation over the past five years to a key competitor. And you can see it. Microsoft, uh, pardon me, uh, McDonald's pulled out Yum! Brands as a competitor. Mm, yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. I don't really look at that sector too much. And we've got some good information here. Now, this is a good research tool, guys, but you cannot take this and copy and paste it in your work. It, it, it just what doesn't, won't, won't, it's not acceptable. So you can use this basis, you can use this as a foundation, almost like an outline. And what I would advise you guys to do is you read this, maybe you remove some sentences, the sentences that are left, what you're going to do is expand them. You're going to start going doing your own research on the topics or the points that were raised in these paragraphs. Another one, in 200 words, recommend how the cost control of Microsoft Corporation could be improved, provide references to literature. And once again, we've got a nice outline here, and we've got some references, not, not a whole bunch, and I think there's only two in there, right? No, there's actually three, I'm so sorry. So there's, there's references in there that will help you understand, and I would advise for something like this, that you go back and read the references, and you'll get better ideas. This is a basic answer. This would not get you many points on any of my assessments uh, at all. It's a, just the basics, just the start. You'd have to blow it up in a major way. Some other tools you've got to be aware of. There's one called Feedly.com, and Feedly.com uses AI to help you do research across websites. So it's the same thing you would do through Google, but you're using a large language model, a tool, to focus. So you don't have to do so much Googling. You go to Feedly, and you set up your profile, and off you go. It'll find things for you. That's a wonderful tool. Another tool is Elicit.org. Now, this is, is this is targets academic papers. Now, watch this. I, I, one thing I, I do a lot of work in is in high frequency trading, and so I've written a lot about it. And I, I set up here, elicit. You can see the prompt: detect serial correlation in high frequency prices. Now, on the right hand side, I said I wanted to sort by citations. Just a tip, guys, when you do your assessments or when you do your dissertation, you will not take just the first hit that you see. You have to find papers, resources that have been cited many, many times. So here you can see I said, please sort it by citations. You can see the first paper that it found that it suggests is relevant. And it kind of looks like it is from the title, right? What we're going to do is we're going to see that it's got 285 citations. The next one's got 250 citations. And when you do your dissertation, you know, specifically, or just any assessment, really, you want to cite, you want to include papers that have been cited many, many times. It's just the way we do things in academia. You don't want to pick a paper that has never been cited or cited maybe three or four times when I will know that there's likely to be a paper that's been cited 10,000 times, some of these academic papers, 5,000 times. That's the kind of resource you want to include in your research. And here's a good one. I can't demonstrate it to you because it's a plugin, and, and, and you have to install it, an extension, I should say. And you have to install it on either, it installs in either Chrome or Safari. And what this does is, you, I'm sure you've gone to websites and you've looked and you said, wow, this is really cool. Yeah, I, I can use this for my assessment. And then you probably do what, what I used to do before I started using, I use a different tool than GLASP uh, I, that I pay for it. So I'm, I'm giving you a free uh, source. Yeah, what I would do before is I would have a, a Word document or a notepad and I would write down the URL and write down what I liked about it. Well, now what you can do, you can use GLASP and it allows you to take notes, and it stores the notes, and it also creates a library of all your links. So later on, you can log back into GLASP, you can find the sources that you found that you thought were very relevant, very appropriate to your research, just copy-paste them, and off you go. You've done some really good research. So that gives you an idea, guys, about ChatGPT. Once again, I do have to warn you, please do not just copy-paste from ChatGPT to an assessment. You have to learn how to use ChatGPT and if you do that, if you become a prompt engineer, you're going to have such an advantage in a job market. I'm telling you right now, it's, it's absolutely amazing. You saw the money they were offering. 
and again, you can go do your own research on the, on job boards and see what they're paying for prompt engineering. You're getting a wonderful education here. By the time you combine your specialist education, whatever it is, with prompt, now knowing how to create prompts for your field, you'll be hyper marketable. That's it for me, guys. Once again, my name is Dave Coker. It's been a wonderful pleasure speaking with you today. Take care.